But uh, we shouldn't spend all day inside listening to long sermons. But we're outside. <laughs> the sun sets at 6 30. <laughs> Gives me about seven hours. There you go. Beautiful. <laughs> a little one comes out. <laughs> Folks. <laughs> Second Peter chapter two. Second Peter chapter one. Sorry. Ellen White called this our pass, our insurance. Sorry, this is our insurance to get into heaven. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity, or love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence. Give what? Diligence. Relax. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Never? Adam and Eve fell, but if you do these things, you will never fall. Great and exceeding precious promises that by taking hold of these by faith you will never fall. Who shall be able to stand during the things that are going about to come upon us? Those who never fall, those who do these things. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. This term, present truth, gets bandied about too often, but you just read present truth, because if you do these things, you will never fall. And since the Garden of Eden, God has had one purpose, and His Word is about one thing, God's plan that we will never fall. That wasn't even in my notes. Um, but as we sang Power in the Blood, I guess y'all have been singing for a while and so you're just out of steam. Is that what I understand? <laughs> Would you be free from the burden of sin? Anyone? Isaiah says it is the sins that have separated between us and our God. The wildfires in... 14,000 homes were destroyed in California Man. by those fires. <clears throat> Last night at about 2.30 in the morning, I was reading some stories in the LA Times about some of the people that died and so on and so forth. The couple that was... One was 100 years old. The wife was 98. They'd been married 75 years. Of natural causes? No. The fire. 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 They were burned in the fire. A family of four that got separated. The son died quickly in the fire. The late the girl lasted for a couple of weeks before she succumbed. Husband and wife were still separated as of the writing of that article. One was in Sacramento in the hospital, the other in San Francisco. They had not yet been told that their children were gone. 
hurricanes, floods, fires, disasters, shootings at Walmart in Denver. You heard about that one a couple nights ago. New York. How long, O oh Lord? The question is for us, how long? Jesus says to us, how long, O oh my people, until you can stand? Uh, last night, and I apologize for being so late, last night I got a call. My parents had been in a very serious car accident. Um, my mother was worse than my father, and they are, they actually both, they were both released from the ER somewhere around midnight last night, so they're both going to live. Um, but at one point when they were, when my mom couldn't move, they were having to cut her clothes away to, you know, and as I thought about that, I thought my mother might be ready to go to the grave. My father is not. My father thinks he's in an okay shape. My mother, who I've been pestering them now for a few years, and I know they are concerned every time they see me, but she is studying her Bible in the way she has never done in her entire life and seeing things. She finally gave up watching soap operas after 30 odd, 40 odd years. She is not ready to stand, but she's walking in the right path. Amen. And that is what we are all called to do. But we're all called to stand because if life should, if God should spare our life to see the final events which will come in our natural lifetime, <clears throat> we will have to stand and not fall. Um, someone, y'all, y'all have Bibles? Uh, someone. Mom has a Bible. Someone turn to Genesis chapter 1. And as we do that, we're going to pray one more time. I also want us to keep uh, Antigone in uh, your prayers. Uh, Y'all probably know more than I do since she's probably updated on Facebook since I talked to her a couple days ago. But... Uh, she is con she's in Canada and considering that these will be the last few days of her mother's life, last few weeks. And so just uh, remember them. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this morning, for another day of life, another day of probation. Father, we are grateful. I am grateful that you have spared my parents' life. Uh, last night, I pray, Father, that you will be with them physically, mentally, and spiritually. Father, I want to lift before you this morning Antigone and her mother. Father, you know all about that situation, and I pray, Father, that during, if these are her last days, Father, that she will turn her heart fully to you. Dear Father, I pray, Lord, that you'll give Antigone wisdom, Father, comfort, endurance, Father, to bless and minister to her mother in these um, difficult times. Father God, this morning I pray that you'll send holy angels to protect this encampment, Father, to keep the devil far away, to keep distractions of our mind far away. I pray, Father, that we will see and understand your word that is able to make us wise unto salvation, your word that you said, if meekly received, is able to save our soul. And so please, Father, I pray that you will speak this morning, that you will put your words in my mouth, Father, and that each of us will hear your voice, each of us will hear your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts, Father, calling us to life eternal. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Rhonda, you have Genesis chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 4. Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, yeah. and the Spirit of God moved yeah. upon the face of the water. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God did what? Divided, divided the light. light.
the earth was in darkness, God created light, and then he separated light from darkness, right? Uh, someone want to get 1 John chapter 1, verses 4 to 10? 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. 1 John chapter 1? Yeah. First John chapter 1, verses one, uh, 4 through 10. Got it. And, these, and these things write we unto you, that your joy may be made full. <coughs> this then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light and he is in and he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. God is what? Light. In him, how much darkness? Apart from him, is the world in light or in darkness? Darkness. John chapter 8, verse 12, the Gospel of John says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. He that followeth me shall not walk in in darkness. How many people do you follow on Facebook? Or on, I don't know, Instagram or Pinterest or... How many people do you follow, do you like? Are they walking in darkness? Are you following? Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, and he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I was asked generally to talk this morning uh, something about country living and, and that aspect of God's word. Um, and I guess we'll get there. Um, but we need to understand a much bigger point. Someone turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. And if, if as we go through these texts, I don't do much preaching. Ellen White says we need more teaching than preaching. If there are questions with regard to the text, feel free. We have a small enough group, right? Jesus is the light of the world, but who's got Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16? Go for it, Sammy. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. <coughs> Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Again, is the world in, largely in darkness or in light? Darkness. 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 Jesus is the light of the world, but he just told his disciples that they were to be the light, and that by doing good works, men should see God and glorify Him. How does a mirror reflect light? 
Where does the mirror need to be pointed in order to reflect light? Light. At the source. What are you looking at? Day after day, are you looking at light or are you looking at darkness? Because you will reflect what you're looking at. And country living is fine, but the internet has darkness surrounding... Yeah. My internet is slow. Eric's got... You've got fiber optics. You've got good internet. But you've got your phone. What are you looking at? Someone get Philippians chapter 2... Someone else, turn your finger to Isaiah chapter 33. Someone, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 16. Isaiah chapter 33. Yeah. 12 to 16. 12 to 16. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God, without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Is it a crooked and perverse generation in which we live? Correct. Hollywood itself is under attack. <clears throat> you know, things are coming out of Hollywood that, again, <laughs> if you're paying attention, if you're watching Little Light Media, if you're paying attention, you know that those people that we love to watch and so forth, they're not planning on heaven. In fact, many of them are intentionally working on the other team. But yet we are constantly watching it. And what we behold, that's what we reflect. Yeah. Can't get a hold of your attitude, your, your whatever. What are you watching? Uh, was it Thursday night? Wednesday night? Tuesday night? Whenever Game 7 of the World Series, I had been sneaking and watching the score. But at some point I realized I may actually be able, we only really pick up one TV station, but I thought I may be able to pick up Fox if I hold the antenna at two spots. And so I snuck into the bedroom to see if I could find the Astros. It was game seven after all. And my wife was coming out of the bathroom, saw what I was doing, and she stood in front of the TV literally to block me. Do I hear praise God? Do I hear amen? So be it. Let it be so. We need each other because we are all trapped in our own foolishness. Again, I heard no amens. Hopefully you're just saying it in tear inside and not lying to yourself. We are all trapped in much foolishness. And until we allow pride to go away and allow someone to help us, we will continue to be following darkness, and that is all we will be able to reflect. <sighs> By the way, is it okay to watch TV or movies? I know Blockbuster made it acceptable for Adventists because we didn't have to go to the theater, and Ellen White had said not to go to the theater. <laughs> there was no movie theater in Ellen White's lifetime. She was talking about going watching plays. She said, no fiction. No fiction. <clears throat> Does Ellen White say anything, folks, that's not in the Bible? In the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything must be established. You cannot be convicted by the testimony of one person, the Bible says. If Ellen White has said it, it is in the Bible. What does what does Philippians chapter four verse eight say, Elder? What does Philippians four eight say? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are, True. what? True. Think on these things. Whatsoever thing, if it's false, do not 
think on it. Revelation 22, verse 15. Do you remember when this formerly youth group... I don't see any youth, I guess. Sabri still qualifies. No, she doesn't. Do you, remember when, do, you, do you remember when this youth group used to spend every Saturday night at the movies? A couple of y'all were around. Sammy, you remember. And we'd come out of a movie theater, uh, usually at Dunvale, and several voices would be heard very exuberantly, much more exuberantly than we sang Power in the Blood, saying, I love that movie! <laughs> And ringing in God's ears, Revelation chapter 22, verse 15, God talks about, in the preceding verses, a beautiful kingdom that he's setting up. But then he says there are some that can never enter that kingdom, including those who love and believe a lie. And ringing in the ears of God on Saturday nights are many Seventh-day Adventists who sat in church Saturday morning and went and watched a movie Saturday night. Again, for a while, now we just go to the theater. When Blockbuster came out, we no longer had to go to the theater. We could safely just bring it into our home. And God hears ringing in his ears, I loved that lie. And God's word unequivocally says, you can never enter my kingdom. And if we had understood the very plain counsel of Ellen White that said, no fiction, because there is nothing she says that is not found in the Word of God. Maren, you have uh, Isaiah chapter 33, verses 14 and 15. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness. Who, who, who's afraid? The sinners in yeah. Zion. Who are we talking about? You talking about the world? No, church. Church. The saints? The sinners in Zion. Yeah, another interpretation says that the sinners in Jerusalem. Yeah, because that's <laughs> the sinners sitting in Seventh Day Adventist churches. Yeah, Spiritual. The sinners, Go ahead. The sinners in Jerusalem. Jonathan, go to Daddy. The sinners in Jerusalem sh shake with fear. Terror seizes the, the godless. Who can I, who can live with this devouring fire? They cry. Who can survive this all consuming fire? Who, by the way, is that consuming fire? Our God, the Bible says, is a consuming fire. Keep going. Another interpretation. I like to read different interpretations, okay? Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppressions, that shakes his hands from holding of bribes, that stops his, hear, his ears from hearing of blood and shudders his eyes from seeing evil. 15? That's fine. You want another interpretation? You see how, you see how hideous the devil is? He's got most of the world believing that sinners, that the lost, will live in hell, a burning hell forever. No such place exists. Hell is this earth. And one day God's going to set it on fire. But who will dwell with everlasting burnings? I am. Amen, Jonathan. You are because you're going to shut your eyes from seeing evil. Jonathan's not going to go to the movies and be entertained by <laughs> adultery and murder and rape and intrigue and all these things that but, God hates. Uh, but I need a boy. Most children by the time they're Jonathan's age have seen thousands of murders. I saw more 
They've heard it. The, the hearing of blood, the seeing of evil. Second, turn to Second Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six. I am starting at verse fourteen. Oh, we love to quote one text as Adventist. If only we would read the Bible. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and then I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. God created light because the earth was full of darkness, and he separated the light from the darkness, and now he says, do not follow in darkness, do not walk in darkness, come out and be separate, and do not touch the unclean thing, and I will be your God. And I will walk with you, I will dwell in you, and then the light of life will shine out of you, and the whole world will know that I am God, because they will see my glory reflected in the mirror that is turned towards me. Someone turn to Exodus chapter 33. <coughs> Someone put their finger in Leviticus chapter 20. Exodus 33 verses 1 to 6. Whoever gets there. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your descendants I will give it, and I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hittite, and the... Jebusite, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now therefore take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do to you. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by mouth. God has taken his people out of Egypt. Moses had gone up to the mountain. God had given them the Ten Commandments. But in the space of a few short days, in less than six weeks, the people made a golden calf says that they rose up to play and drink. And this, this text is repeated in Hebrews because God needs us to understand. Because they called it, Aaron said, tomorrow we will worship the God. But it was not the worship that God had asked for. In fact, when Joshua came down, he said, I hear the sound of war. What's the sound of war? Drums, trumpets, loud. Joshua thought he heard the sound of war. Moses said, oh my God. That's not war in the camp. Moses had understood what the people were doing, calling it worship to God, but they had taken off all the earrings and the trinkets and the bangles and rings and so forth that they had come out of Egypt with, and God knows where this stuff tends, and they had quickly made a golden god, a calf of gold. When it popped out, Aaron said, this is the god that led you out of Egypt. Say what? 
And in the very next chapter, in the very next breath, God said, I am still going to take these people so unworthy and I'm going to take them into the promised land. But if I go with them, I will consume them. And so I'll just send an angel to go before him and they will drive out the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the rest of the sites. But God said, you're going to the promised land, get rid of the jewelry. It doesn't exist there because jewelry is actually what caused Satan to go south. You, under, you realize that? You understand that? Satan was covered with jewels. The Bible says his heart was lifted up by reason of his brightness. He saw, him, he saw all the bling, thought that it was him being so bright, but he stood in the presence of God, reflected God's glory, but he looked down and got so full of himself that by reason of his brightness he was corrupted and God says I am ne I made man out of dirt I covered Satan with, with with jewels man I made out of dirt but man is trying to look like Lucifer by covering himself in jewels and I will never allow it into the promised land I will never allow it into heaven get it off it's not an Adventist rule I grew up thinking it was an Adventist rule it's a biblical rule <laughs> okay God is about to send these people up, but he tells Moses, I'm not going with you. We'll pick up the story in verse 12. Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people. And thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Because God says, Jesus says, I'm not going with you, I'll send an angel. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way. What's God's way? Someone. The thy way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. Show me thy way that I might know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest and he said unto him if thy presence go not with me carry us not up hence do you want to go to heaven does anyone here want to go to heaven yes. one time God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 God said to Abraham I'm gonna send you I'm gonna give you God said I am your great reward and what did Abraham respond? What? Well, you give me. What will you give me? <laughs> Say again? I just told you. I just told you I am your great and exceeding reward. And Abraham's response was, what do I get? God said to Moses some hundreds of years later, I'm going to give you the promised land, everything that I promised to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but I can't go with you. And Moses said, if you're not going, I don't want it. <coughs> because all of us want streets of gold. But do we want the God of the gold? <coughs> Verse 16, Exodus 33, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. What makes the difference? How would God's people be separated from all the people on the earth? Would it be country living? Would it be taking off the jewelry? Would it be dress reform, diet reform? <clears throat> God in us is the hope of glory, and it is the only hope of glory, because if God would live in us, then we would be different and separated from all the peoples of the earth. And if God can get us on one side and the rest on the other side, then he can take us home. He once separated the light from the darkness by speaking, but now he's not a rapist. And since we love darkness, we love to follow darkness. We don't have time to read the Bible, but we have time to follow darkness. 
God is not a rapist, and so he cannot just force us to do what we don't want to do. God is love. He is not rape. He does not force. Who had their finger in Leviticus chapter 20? Anyone have that? Leviticus chapter 20, verses 22 to 26. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments, and do them, that the land, whether I bring you to dwell in, therein, you, you, not out. out. By the way, all those judgments and statutes, without getting into it since I'm about to take all the seven hours anyway, that's the writings of Ellen White. God gave all those statutes and judgments because the people were too sin-sick to understand Ten Commandments, and so he had to break it down for them and give them rules. And because we couldn't understand that we were to think on what is true, because we couldn't understand that those who believe a lie cannot ever enter heaven, God gave Ellen White, who told us, no fiction. <laughs> statutes and judgments to break it down and make it clear, because unless we do, unless we can do follow those little rules, we'll never understand God's big rules, and the land would just spew us out. We'd get to heaven and the angels, we would smell so bad, the angels would kick us right out. You want to start that over? You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and do them, that the land, whether I bring you to dwell therein, spew you not out. And you shall not walk in the manners of the nation, which I cast out before you. For they committed all these things, and therefore I abhorred them. 24. But I have said unto you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess a land that floweth with milk and honey. And I am the Lord your God, which hath separated you from other people. You shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean, and between unclean fowls and clean, and you shall not make your souls abominable by beasts, or by fowl, or by any manner of living thing that creepeth from the ground which I have separated from you as unclean. God wants a clear separation between clean and unclean. Come out from among them and do not touch the unclean thing. Last week, the Sabbath school lesson said at least one thing right. The system of the Jews, the system of the Jews could never save them. And the system of Adventism can never save us. God wants a difference between clean and unclean. Not that we don't eat pork and don't eat shellfish. That will never save us. God wants to put a difference to separate us. And when we understand what God is trying to do, His system can save us. We'll stop there. Uh, this is from Testimonies, Volume 5, page 455. God says, God has called His church in this day as He called ancient Israel to stand as a light in the earth by the mighty cleaver of truth. You know what a cleaver is? It's not a little knife. Cleaver, when you put a cleaver down. Is it like a machine? Big butcher knife. That's a big butcher knife. Mm -hmm. You know that square knife with the handle sticking out that you chop a bone into? Oh, that's, right. that's a cleaver. God has, by the mighty cleaver of truth, the messages of the first, second, and third angel's messages that we are so afraid to preach. He has separated them from the churches and from the world to bring them into a sacred nearness to himself. There is no darkness in God. In him is light and there is no darkness at all. And if we love to follow the light, there cannot be a sacred nearness to God because he does not dwell with sin. He does not dwell in darkness. Our sins, Isaiah says, have separated between us and our God. Some people, well, we just need to focus on the relationship. Not worry about this. Just focus on the relationship. Our sins have separated between us and our God. There is no relationship 
when we love sin. God says if we regard iniquity in our heart, He will not hear us. <laughs> if I, again, Matt, God threw me a bone this week when Deshaun Watson broke his leg or tore his ACL. Right? All of a sudden, the Texans have a quarterback. Now is Neil. Uh, uh, look, uh. Sin is so entangled in me, so entangled in us. We desperately need God. I desperately need God. Ezra chapter 9, verse 1. The time of Ezra is when God's people are left, are gone out of captivity and have been allowed to go back and rebuild the wall. That's what Adventists are supposed to be doing, rebuilding the wall. Now, when these things were done, Ezra 9, 1, the princes came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Kardashians, the American Idols, the Texans. My people, I've sent them back. I've given them the law. They're supposed to be rebuilding the wall, but I look up and my, they're just they're partying with the people. Ezra had learned that Israel's... This is from Prophets and Kings, page 620. Ezra had learned that God's apostasy was largely traceable to their mingling with heathen nations. He had seen that if they had obeyed God's command to keep separate from the nations surrounding them, they would have been spared many sad and humiliating experiences. Now when he learned that notwithstanding the lessons of the past, men of prominence had dared to transgress the laws given as a safeguard against apostasy, his heart was stirred within him. That leaders in the church didn't care anymore. He thought of God's goodness and again giving his people a foothold in their native land and he was overwhelmed with righteous indignation and with grief at their ingratitude. How many of your pastors stand in the pulpit on a weekly basis they give examples from movies? Or sports. Someone needs to stand up with righteous indignation and do what Ezra did. And I'll leave it for you to go and read what Ezra and Nehemiah and these people did. But someone needs to stand up with righteous indignation at God's leaders and say, What the? What in the name of God are you doing? Genesis chapter 4. Was there a murder in Southwest Houston last night? I'm sure there was. Probably. Isn't there every night? Cain, after killing his brother, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and he dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch and he builded a city. And called, the na and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. That's not the Enoch that is the longest man to never die. The longest, the ma longest man that ever longest lived. Living man. Well, he was the longest man to never die because right. he, he started he's, doing it before, before right. anybody he's, else well, did. Right. Methuselah was the oldest man that ever died. And the, the, Enoch's the oldest man that ever lived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first murderer was the first guy that went and built a city. What do you expect to find in the city, folks? Traffic. Confusion. Conjection, crime, murder. Because that's what it's founded on. And it was a founded on a person who named the city after his son because he's full of himself. And that's what the city is. Full of itself. Read articles that Adventists send out and people that pastors love to live in the city because they look and look up against the tall buildings. How stupid are we? We can see what man built because we need to see what God made because if you stand out in nature and you see what God made, the buildings will never impress you.
TP? Because I'm putting on. Put on your shoes when you go far. Just put on your shoes. Ask Ask that man and tell you. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 81. Upon receiving the curse of God, Cain had withdrawn from his father's household. He had first chosen his occupation as a tiller of the soil. Because that's God's occupation for us. And by the way, that's what we're going to be doing in heaven once again. We often tell people to keep the Sabbath because Jesus did it and we'll be doing it in heaven, so why not do it now? Well, guess what we're going to be doing in heaven? Why not start now? It's a lot of hard work, by the way. He had gone out from the presence of the Lord, cast away the promise of the restored Eden to seek his possessions and enjoyments in the earth under the curse of sin, thus standing at the head of that great class of men who worship the God of this world. He had thrown in his lot in the city because there's where wealth can be accumulated. We're still doing it, and he stands as the head of this class of people. In that which pertains to mere earthly and material progress, his descendants became distinguished. Abel had led a pastoral life, dwelling in tents and booths, and the descendants of Seth followed the same course, counting themselves strangers and pilgrims on the earth, seeking a better country, that is, a heavenly. For some time, the two classes remained separate. Separate. The race of Cain, spreading from the place of their first settlement, dispersed over the plains and valleys where the children of Seth had dwelt, and the latter, in order to escape from their contaminating influence, withdrew to the mountains and there made their home. So long as this separation continued, they maintained the worship of God and its purity. But in the lapse of time, they ventured little by little to mingle with the inhabitants of the valleys. This association was productive of the worst results. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were feared. The children of Seth, attracted by the beauty of the daughters of Cain's descendants, displeased the Lord by intermarrying with them. Many of their worshippers of God were beguiled into sin by the allurements that were now constantly before them, and they lost their peculiar holy character. Mingling with the depraved, they became like them in spirit and in deeds. It is impossible not to mingle with darkness and not to become like it. Why can't you get those traits out of your character? Why can't you get impatience? Why can't I get impatience out? because I drive amidst the mix of impatient people. As soon as I get into Houston, Jacqueline hates it. As soon as we hit 45, really around Conroe now, since Houston extends to Conroe, basically, the drivers start racing around you, and it doesn't bother me so much. Jacqueline just can't stand it. You f it, it feels different. I never know how different it is out here until I went to the tax office whatever the 31st was, to get my discount on paying less than one-tenth of my taxes, property taxes for my last year in Houston, although I have land that's 250 times bigger. Something like that. Anyway, uh, the people are just so nice. They're not hurried, which sometimes bothers me because I still have the city living in me. But they're relaxed, and they're just pleasant, and it's just... It's just it's so different than going into a government building in Houston. You actually find a parking spot, too. Oh, well, yeah, that's <laughs> never a problem. Thank you, man. Who's got Proverbs 14.12? Who's got Proverbs 16.25? Why don't you just say it with me? There's a way to a man, but the ends are the ways of death, right? God repeats this actually three times. The Lord had declared to Israel, this is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 634, the Lord had declared to Israel, you shall not do every, you shall not do every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes, but you shall observe and hear all these words that I command thee. In deciding upon the course of action, we are not to ask whether we can see that harm will result from it, but whether it is in keeping with the will of God. The question is not whether we can see whether this is going to be good or bad. This is what elders sit around and say, well, this seems right to us. Well, who cares? The question is, do you have permission from God? 
you know what the Bible says? You know, I've had, again, elders, and, well, Neil, you say you know, we should only do with the Bible because you know we can't find it in the Bible. <laughs> well, then don't do it. You're not that smart. You can word search your Bible, you can get an index of Ellen White's writings, and if you can find it in Ellen White's writings, then it is in the Bible and you can do it. If it's not, then don't. Because there's a way that seems right to a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Y'all need a break. Neil, um, I think that... Uh Lot is a good example. Oh, we're going to get there. That. Okay, I won't jump the gun. No, because there's there's some incredibly incredibly powerful counsel told us of Lot. So, uh, uh, turn to Leviticus. Who's got their Bible? Uh, Ivan, Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. Leviticus 11, 44 and 45. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourself, and you shall be holy, for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Why be holy? Because God is holy. Can, should you be holy minus one? Not holy. Half holy? Not holy at all. Is it the same word in Hebrew? No idea. I don't know. Yeah, it's the same word in Hebrew. Be holy, God says, because I'm holy. Because again, if you read your Sabbath school lesson week after week, they'll tell you that you God is one standard and you're supposed to be another standard because you can't be like God. You have a different nature, which is a Catholic doctrine, but anyway. Be holy, God says, because I am holy. Ivan, uh, Leviticus 19, verse 2. Leviticus 19, verse 2. Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Speak to how many of the children of Israel? All the congregation. Be holy, because I am holy. Leviticus 27, Ivan. 27, verse? Uh, 20, sorry, verse 7. 20, chapter 20, verse 7. 20, verse 27. Verse 7, verse 7. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Chapter 20, verse 26. And you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. I am holy, you be holy, because I am holy, and I have done what? Separated. separated you from the people for what purpose? You should be mine. Because if you're not separated, are you his? If you're following the world, are you his? Adventists think that because we park our, church, our car in front of a church building on Saturday morning, we're saved. We need to go talk to people that park their cars on, on Sunday morning in front of church buildings. We think, folks... That lesson last quarter was so misguided on Galatians. <laughs> Folks, circumcision is a sign. And you know what the Sabbath is? It's a sign. That I, the Lord thy God, doth Seal. sanctify thee. Is the Sabbath a sign of a completed work? Because if God isn't completely sanctifying us, then the Sabbath is a useless idol, just like... Uh, circumcision. Do you understand that? That's all Paul was saying in Galatians and 13 weeks couldn't figure that out. If you don't believe me, go read the short chapter in Acts, on the, Acts of the Apostles on the book of Galatians. In a few pages, 13 weeks, they couldn't figure it out, but testimony of Jesus gets it right pretty quickly. Say it with me, Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore because as, even as your Father which is in heaven is, Perfect. it's the same word in Greek. There's not two standards. <clears throat> Christ, 
Luke chapter 6, I found someone, we were having a discussion on a Saturday afternoon, and the next morning I watched a sermon. Because again, these days it's popular among the learned theologians and the doctors of the law to, di to discuss, mind. huh? Hedy and high mind. What does perfect mean? I don't know Greek and I don't know Hebrew, but I know English. Luke chapter 6 verse 40 very simply says, The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is. Everyone that would be perfect is as his master. Who is your master? Christ Object Lessons, page 67 to 69. We're, we're, we're starting to transition. <laughs> there can be no gro growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. Before I left Houston, everyone understood self must <coughs> die. There is, can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. If you have accepted Christ as a personal Savior, you are to forget self and try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ. Tell of His goodness. Do every duty that presents itself. Carry the burden of souls upon your heart and by every means in your power seek to save the lost. That's the only purpose for being in, a, in, in the city, by the way, is missionary endeavors. Who's a missionary? Who has died to self and is doing everything in your power to save others? Because that's the sole purpose for which you exist and that you're there. Carry the burden of souls upon your heart and by every means in your power to seek to save the lost. As you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish labor and love for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the Spirit will ripen in your character, your faith will increase, your convictions will deepen, your love will be made perfect. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure and noble and lovely and true. And if there's any virtue and if there's any... Think on these things, not on fiction. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. She's quoting Galatians 5.22. I'll add verse 24, against which there is no law. This fruit can never <clears throat> perish, but will produce after its kind a harvest unto eternal life. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. She's quoting it, but not citing Mark chapter 4, verse 29. When the fruit is brought forth immediately God puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people. How? Then he will come to claim them as his own. Does anyone long for Jesus to come? Amen. Do you enjoy watching the nightly news and seeing where the latest terror attack was? Do you enjoy watching the nightly news and see how much of California and Colorado and Wyoming and Nevada are on fire? Do you long to, do you love to see how many people got shot at the, con at the, the concert in Las Vegas? By the way, have you seen the video of the man shouting as people went in saying, telling them to repent? No. Mm -hmm. Have you watched that video? Yep. Wait. I'm not sure I agree with his methods, but as people went into their concert, there was a man saying, repent. One guy came up into his face and said, oh, I love the devil. Another guy said, well, I am Christian. And he said, well, if you're going into this concert and the, all these people are wearing these clothes, you're not a Christian. How can you glorify God by going in there? You know? Be separate and do not touch the unclean thing. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as own. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's referring to 2 Peter 3. 
were all who profess his name bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel, quickly the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain, because as soon as the fruit is ripe, as soon as the wheat, the corn is ripe, there are wheat and tears in God's church, but as soon as the grain is ripe, immediately the last great harvest will begin. This is what God's people have failed to understand. We want to bring people in the church so they can look like us and park their cars in front of our church on Saturday morning. We're doing Revelation Speaks Peace. We've started at my church this morning. We just did uh, Shadow Empire and, and what's the other one? Pale. Pale Horse Rides. And we will tell them, we already told them about the Sabbath, we'll tell them about the state of the dead, we will never tell them about the sanctuary. Because it is there that God says, this is my way, because in the Day of Atonement, sin must be put away. This is the only reason this denomination exists. Do you understand that? The Seventh-day Adventist denomination exists because of Daniel 8, 13, and 14. On the 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. It exists because of Revelation chapter 14. Fear God and give glory to Him because the hour of His judgment has come. If we don't preach the sanctuary, then God has no reason to allow us to exist. If we're going to do a Sabbath school lesson and we're going to repeatedly cite Luther and talk about righteousness by faith, and we're going to talk about salvation as if it is just justification and the sanctification is not an integral part of it, then we have gone backwards to the time of Luther. And if all we need is Lutherans and Baptists, then we can cease to exist. And oh, by the way, we will. Because if you have a tool that doesn't work, you throw it away. And God's church is not a denomination. God's church is not an organization. God's church is the faithful people of Jesus Christ. God's, Jesus said that his church, the gates of hell would never prevail against it. Did the gates of hell prevail against the church in the Middle Ages? In the Dark Ages? Because God had a faithful people. They were called Waldenses. They were called Huguenots. God has a faithful people. Those who are faithful to God are the church of God. Not because we call ourselves by a name. Not because we think we're Israel. Not because we think we're spiritual Israel. There's not another denomination to come. Don't misunderstand. But God's church is his faithful people. And we desperately need to understand that. Who's got uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 9? 2 Peter chapter 3. Our brains, our brains still engaged, or did I lose everyone? Preach, brother. Preach. Second Peter three. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine to fourteen, Matt. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements will burn, will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things, you, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and good godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of, the, of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blemish. blemish. How many times have you heard Adventists debate whether how God's people live, whether it can we can hasten the coming of Jesus? What? How many times have you heard Adventists debating whether we can whether we can have an impact on when God comes? I've heard this debate countless times. I've engaged in it. Did God's word just very clearly say that how God's people live will hasten his coming? Or conversely, how they live will slow it down. God should have been here more than a hundred years ago. We were told expressly, and by the way, there is a limit. You just read that there is a limit, but the day that God will come by. 
Second Peter, Second Peter opens and God says, I'm writing to my, uh, to my church, to my saints. Chapter 3 again makes the point, I'm writing to the saints of God. <laughs> The reason why God has not come is because he's not slack concerning his promise. He doesn't want his people to perish because if the final events start right now, we're all toast. I asked a loved one again. I just, I don't understand. I asked a loved one recently. I said, are you ready to be sealed? No. No, no. He said, yes. He said, yes. He said, yes. I'm not perfect, but God knows my heart. The thing that a king seals with his ring can no man change, Esther 8, 8. When God seals something, it will not change. If you are not perfect and God seals you, you will have sin in your heart for eternity and no thing, such thing can enter the kingdom of God. God's people are so self-deluded, just like the people of Galatians who thought that because they went to church on Saturday morning that they were saved. Because they followed their own little rituals and didn't eat pepperoni on their pizza that they were saved. Ellen White says very clearly, they were not keeping the commandments of God, but because they did little deeds of the law and works of the law, they thought they were saved. And God's people not following the commandments of God, but we do our little things and tell others that they should do them. And we think we're ready to be sealed. We think that we're ready to be saved. Revelation chapter 6. I'm starting at verse 7. The sixth seal has broken out. We are living in the time of the sixth seal, but we haven't gotten all of there. God, Mo, uh, John, looking at what happens during the sixth seal, says, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Every single person here can answer that question. Who shall be able to stand? The 144,000. The 144,000. That's the text we opened with. Paul said, if you do these things, you will never fall. You will be able to stand. And so an entrance will be given to you to the kingdom of heaven. That's why Jesus Christ can say to every church, to him that overcometh will I give. To him that overcometh will I give. To him that overcometh. Overcometh what? Sin. Sin. Because it's what's been separating us from God for 6,000 years. Amen. To him that overcometh will I give. Revelation 6, verse 17, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? The answer, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth on the wind, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on, on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, until we have sealed the servants of our God in the foreheads. I cannot allow the sixth seal to fully break out, much less Jesus Christ to come, until I can seal my servants in their foreheads. God is not slack concerning his promise. But when he pronounces that let him who is holy be holy still, let him who is righteous be righteous still, and let him that is filthy be filthy still. Do you see why Jesus is not here? Whose fault? Has he undertaken a construction project in heaven that's just taken too long? You know, construction projects always get delayed. So maybe it's over budget. By the way, Jesus Christ did not go to build mansions. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And you know what he was going to prepare? There's a sanctuary. There's a sanctuary that is dirty with my sins. And since 1844, he's been trying to clean it. And by the way, the dead do not sin. Hey, we, this group, we, the, the dead men talk. When you, when you play paintball, it's a cardinal rule. If you're shot, shut up. Don't tell the other team. Dead men don't sin. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And the living, unfortunately, God's people are still sending sins into the most holy place. And he can't finish cleansing it because we're not clean. And in patience and mercy, he's waiting for me and for you. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And then he'll go on and talk about every tribe because this is Seventh-day Adventists who are going to be sealed. The only people that call themselves spiritual Israel. I don't have time to prove that to you this afternoon, but turn to Revelation chapter 13. 
Revelation chapter 13, we see the mark of the beast. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And I looked, chapter 14, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Heard a sermon last week, badly butchering this. These people are before the throne of God in type. You've just seen the mark of the beast is being administered, and at that same time, God is sealing his people. And in type, they stand in the very presence of a holy God who cannot stand in the presence of sin. 144,000 having their father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of a many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song except the 144,000. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. What does women represent? Church. Churches. They are not defiled with the false Babylon of false churches. They follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. Where is the Lamb this morning? In the most holy place. Can you follow him in there without with sin? No. You will die. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits unto God and the Lamb. A whole nother Bible study. And in their mouth was found no guile, just as it is said of Jesus, because if you are perfect, you will be as your master. For they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And what is the everlasting gospel? Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fount of waters. How do you fear God? To hate sin. Go look at ex. Uh, I didn't put them down here. Go look at Proverbs eight thirteen. To fear God is to depart from evil. Proverbs sixteen six. To fear God is to hate evil. Go look at Exodus twenty eight twenty verse twenty. God says the fear of God is before you that you sin not. Go look at Proverbs. I think it's chapter three verse seven. The fear of God is to hate and to depart from evil. This is the everlasting gospel. God told Adam and Eve in the garden, stay away from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Everything that I have made is good. And when the serpent came and said, if you eat of this fruit, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Eve should have ran because this was the everlasting gospel. Run from evil. How many of us are entertained by evil? We love to watch dramas based on adultery, based on rape, based on murder, based on whodunit. We love evil. We love comedies, laughing at people's screw-ups and errors. We love evil. God says, fear God, depart from evil, hate evil, and give glory to Him. How do we give glory to Him? Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit against which there is no law, love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give God glory. The everlasting gospel is very simple. Hate sin and do good. <coughs> This is the basis of our church. And folks, every Adventist used to know this. It goes on to verse 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Not that tell others to keep them. But here are those that keep the commandments of God. And then as soon as God has a perfect people who take the message with power. And I looked and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud sat one like unto the Son of Man. Having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. Another angel came out of the temple, saying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come to, for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is... Because as soon as the grain is ripe, immediately God puts in the sickle. Do you understand that Revelation 14, on which the church is based, has been telling us a very simple matter? As soon as God can have a people that he can seal, the message is going to go and the final, and God will come. The harvest of the earth can begin. Folks, you're weary. Ezekiel chapter uh, 36, go home and read it. 
God says, everywhere my people go, they profane my name. But, as, but for God says, for my name's sake, I'm going to give them a new heart. And as soon as I do it, all the world will know that I'm God. As soon as I can give my people a new heart, but I'm not a rapist. Ezekiel 11 makes clear that God cannot give a new heart to those who love sin. He will not hold you down, rip out your heart that loves the Texans, loves fiction, loves foolishness. He will not rape you, but if you desire a new heart, he will give it to you. Matthew chapter 24, turn to Matthew chapter 24, because God is going to write what in our, in our foreheads? His name. This is the seal of God. Which, by the way, what was written on the mitre of the high priest? Holiness to God. Go look it up in, in Exodus. Holiness to God. When God can write holiness to God, the final harvest comes, we go home. Matthew chapter 24, because Adventists, again, we love to quote verse 14, but we won't read the passage and understand. Matthew chapter 24, I'm starting somewhat randomly at verse 6. The disciples have asked Jesus, what's the sign of your coming? What's the sign of the end? Jesus says, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilence, earthquake in various places. Are we seeing these things? Oh, yes. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Sit back and relax. <laughs> The final events will be what kind of ones, folks? Rapid. Rapid. Verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. What just happened? Sunday law. Sunday law. All these things are the beginning of sorrows, and Adventists are kind of getting relaxed, and we go about, and we do our things, and yeah, there's fuds and fires and whatever, and murders and whatever, and ho-hum, what are we doing Saturday night? Have you seen the latest movie? Texans are doing really well. Deshaun Watson's really lighting things up. <laughs> then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Why? You shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Because God has written his name in our forehead. A seal has come. And now it's on. It's real time. But did you get... Did you need to be ready before or after you're sealed? Before. Let him who is righteous be righteous still. A seal does not change anything. It only sets in place what already exists. So then follow this. Then shall many be offended and shall betray one another, shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because the iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When did the gospel go to the nations, folks? Before or after the sealing? In Ezekiel, when did it go? After God gave his people a new heart, at which time they would not sin. After, in Revelation, God sealed his people. Then the gospel went. Then the end came. When did the, when did the harvest begin? When the grain was ripe, when it was perfect, when he could seal us. When did Ellen White say? God is waiting for us to, with longing desire to perfectly reproduce his character. Then... The harvest begins, then God will come for his people. Is the Bible clear? God's people may not understand this. We just run around thinking that if we can make people park their cars in front of the church on sun on Saturday morning, that we're in good shape. This is not the plan of God. Romans chapter 13, verse 11, 14. Oh. Do all these texts sound the same, by the way? Ellen White in Education, verse 125, says every, for every passage of the Bible is about one subject. The redemption of man, the bringing back of man to a state where God can seal him. Every passage in the Bible is about one subject. So if these verses, if these passages sound repetitive, again, when you study the lesson, the Sabbath school lesson, and they said one verse here and one verse there the next day and then tell you a bunch of foolishness, often what was written by Catholics and other churches, not even us, you'll never pick this up. But if you'll read passages, you'll understand very clearly that God is talking about one thing throughout his book, whether it's Galatians or Romans or any book. Revelation, uh, Romans chapter 13, I want to skip, but this stuff is too good. And knowing that, that, and that, knowing the time, do we know the time? 
God says the storks in the heaven know the time, but God's people don't know the time. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantingness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Do not make provision for the flesh. Do not turn on the TV, Neil. Just don't do it. If your thing is Instagram or Pinterest or whatever, just don't go to it. Make no provision for the flesh. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. This is a very powerful statement God gives us, tells us about the new heart from Hebrews chapter 8 through Hebrews chapter 10. He says, He that is promised is faithful. Then he goes through the entire chapter of Hebrews, the great faith chapter, trying to get you to understand that God can give you that new heart against which you will not sin. He tells you at the end of the chapter, folks, that God did not give the promise to all these other people, but they can never be made perfect until God makes us perfect, because God is the God of the living, not the dead. Then in Hebrews chapter 12, he opens and begins to say, Wherefore, wherefore, <laughs> seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so it does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How do we do this? Looking to Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. Christ in us is the hope of glory. It's not country living. It's not dress reform. It's not diet reform. It's not a million reforms. All these things must be done. Every single one of them must be done. But they're not our salvation. Because when we think that they are our, our thing, then we get, we get so full of pride and we tell people, look what I did. And look, I'm eating raw and I did this and I'm doing that and I'm living here. And I... Folks, pride is always lying at our door. Right. Jesus Christ is the only one that can save us. Christ in us is the only hope of glory. But unless we make no provision for the flesh. And so God continues then in Hebrews 12 and he says, verse 11, Now no chastening for the present seems joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Anyone have weak hands, feeble knees? Anyone struggling with sin? And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. Be holy, for I, the Lord thy God, am holy, and if you're not holy, you can never see Him. Don't think because you're Seventh-day Adventist, because you don't eat pepperoni, because you park your church, your car on Saturday morning, without which you cannot see God looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. Oh, we're covered by grace. I don't hear grace in that man's sermons. You know what grace is? Hebrews, uh, Titus chapter 2, Romans chapter 2. Grace is what turns you from sin. Grace is what teaches you to deny ungodliness. Be diligent lest you fail of God's grace. looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Is there a root of bitterness? Is there someone or something that you get mad at, that you get angry at? Jesus said when he disputed with Satan about the body of Moses, he durst not bring a railing accusation against him. And I'm still trying to learn this. I'm still trying to learn what Ellen White says, to be earnest but not vehement. Earnest but not vehement. Fundamentals of Christian education. He who taught Adam and Eve in Eden how to tend the garden would instruct men today. By the way, sorry folks, it wasn't Paul. Paul was an Adventist and didn't know anything what he was talking about. We must till the soil. And I'm, you can do some no-till gardening, but it ain't easy. Paul made me think if I just did a few things up front, it'd be easy. It ain't easy. Do I hear amen? Amen. <laughs> There is wisdom for him who holds the plow and plants and sows the seed. The earth has its concealed treasures, and the Lord would have thousands and tens of thousands working upon the soil who are crowded in the cities to watch for a chance to earn a trifle. You know who Ellen White wrote this for? 
Like every prophet of God, these things are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. <coughs> they are written as, as, as in samples, types, prophecies, shadows. The prophets of God, she says, wrote less for their own time than for the age of to come, especially for that generation that would live amidst the last scenes of this earth's history. God would have thousands